There we go. Uh, so this, uh, I don't know if anyone in the room actually even knows what this is, uh, but this was the first computer that I ever got. So uh, when I was about seven or eight, my dad used me as an excuse to buy stuff that he wanted. So he told my mum, uh, Eamon wants uh, a Sinclair Spectrum. This is a computer with a whopping 48K uh, of memory. Uh, and in the 80s, uh, when this came out, you could buy magazines and the back kind of eight or 10 pages of the magazines would literally be code printed out that you would then copy, like you would manually type in uh, and execute and you could play games. And that's where I learned how to code on, on basic. I used to code games and name them after girls that I liked, which uh, was not a strategy that was successful in 1980s Ireland. Being an entrepreneur is, is a lot cooler nowadays than it is, uh, or than it was back then. Uh, I've also done a bunch of other stuff. So um, I've, I've started three companies, uh, two of which were thankfully successful, one of which not so much. Uh, we can talk about that in the Q&A. Uh, did the world's first. We did a suite of mobile travel guides in, in Arabic for, for countries in the Middle East. This is the uh, travel guide that we did, the first one to Kabul, uh, which told you where not to go in the city rather than where to go, uh, which was an interesting <laughs> twist on the scenario. Here we go. Um, and then I don't know if anyone remembers this game, or will anyone actually admit to playing it? Um, so Farmville is a game that came out on Facebook in 2010. It was a farm management game. So you could plant strawberries, harvest strawberries, milk cows, help your friends, do all of these different things. But it was a very kind of spammy user interface. To actually do anything, you had to invite your friends to do things. So it's like, oh, help me get the lamb home. Help me do all of these kind of different things. Um, and what it led to was lots and lots of people getting notifications like this. Uh, so before Facebook had the algorithm in its news feed, uh, this was what you used to see, like just endless lines and lines and lines and lines and lines of, of people kind of doing nice things to, to one another on, on uh, Facebook. And people got uh, very annoyed by it. So this is one of the things that people put up. This is the kind of PG-13 version of it. <laughs> like this is what I can actually show. Uh, and you're all grown up, so you know. Anyway, people hated it. Like it was incredibly annoying, incredibly spammy, incredibly scammy, and all of these things. And so some friends and I were sitting uh, one night indulging in, in one of my favorite pastimes. We were sitting in a bar in Dublin, uh, getting uh, a few drinks in, and uh, we were increasingly frustrated with what was happening uh, with this game. And so we thought, well, why has no one come up with a way where you can do really horrible things? Like, why do you have to be nice and say, oh, I'm going to you know, help you, uh, you know, harvest strawberries on your land? Like, why can't you fuck with people? Who were, who were playing Farmville. Uh, and so we came up with Farmville, uh, where you could do really horrible things. So in this instance, you could give your neighbor's cows uh, mad cow disease, you could salt the earth on their land, you could do a bunch of, of other uh, horrible things to them. Um, and we launched it as a little bit of a, a joke, really. I mean, it wasn't a particularly brilliant or even very functional game. Uh, but we launched it after a week of, of kind of, uh, you know, developing it. And a couple of hundred people used it, and then a couple of thousand people used it. And it grew. It was, you know, it was a, a viral sensation. The, the proudest moment, probably still, of my career was the minute where um, Kotaku, which is a, a big uh, gaming website, called us the South Park of Facebook, um, which uh, I was I was pretty pleased by. Uh, anyway, we ended up. Uh, it got kind of crazy big. So we, we ended up with about a million people playing it every day. We were getting fan mail. We were getting requests to do merchandise. We were getting all of this kind of stuff going on. We got sued by Chuck Norris, which I'll talk about a little bit later on. Uh, lost, threatened with a lawsuit by Chuck Norris, I should say. Um, so a lot of crazy stuff happened. Um, but this showed me the power of building something that people loved. Like we were getting mail from people going, "You're putting a smile on my face after a shitty day. Like this is incredible." Uh, and getting that more than anything else was was probably the most rewarding part of the whole uh, product journey. Uh, we ended up selling the company to, to GameStop uh, a couple of months actually after we, we started it, um, which is another story that we can talk about when the cameras aren't on. Um, but it was uh, an interesting journey. Uh, subsequently helped lots and lots of other companies. So uh, helped the guys from Keep, which is a rewards network, gives people rewards when they uh, have achievements in, in games and apps. Uh, so help them launch outside the US, so Ireland, or UK, Middle East, uh, opened our Japan office and Taiwan office and, and, and more. Um, and for the last six years have been involved at Techstars. Uh, so hopefully, does everyone here, has everyone heard of Techstars? Maybe you don't have to fire our PR team. Um, so for those of you who don't know, Techstars is the worldwide network that helps 
entrepreneurs succeed. Our goal is to kind of help entrepreneurs from, from inspiration through to IPO. And, and we do that in a couple of different ways. We run very early stage programs like Startup Weekend, which again, hopefully many of you have, have heard of or, or attended, where over a 54 hour period, people get together, pitch ideas, form teams and build MVPs and uh, um, uh, prototypes and early versions of their of their product. Uh, Startup Week, which uh, again, we like very literal names for what we do. Uh, so Startup Week is a week-long uh, event in different cities around the world, uh, now 100 cities every year. Startup Weekend is in 160 countries around the world. Startup Digest is a, a mail-out that goes to millions of, of subscribers around the world around themes and topics and, and, and more. Uh, and we run accelerator programs, which is what most of my time is taken up with. Uh, so we have uh, invested now in over two, actually these numbers are slightly out of date, but over 2,000 companies who've raised over $6 billion. The portfolio valuation is close to $20 billion now. Um, and we've had probably closer to 200 exits, um, which, is, which is great. So we try and give companies two years worth of experience in, in, in a three month period. Uh, we invest in about 500 companies every year uh, around the world. And we do programs which are horizontal, which is what I do, kind of any stage, any sector, any type of company. And then we do partner programs with Barclays around FinTech, for example, Amazon Alexa, around voice technology, uh, with some Apple Next in, in Lisbon around kind of uh, travel technology and, and, and other areas. So again, going through a program, but also building a relationship with, uh, with a big corporate. Um, and we do lots of other stuff after, so it's not just, you know, you go through a three-month program and it's see you later. Uh, we allow, we, you know, we run lots and lots of networking events. This is an event we did in Oakland last year where we had 800 founders, 300 uh, VCs, and 300 corporates uh, come together for a kind of two-day festival of, of networking and hanging out. Uh, this was our first IPO, so SendGrid, uh, who went through our Boulder program in, in 2009, uh, went public two years ago, uh, and were subsequently acquired by, by Twilio. Um, and this is the, the footprint that we have now. So as I say, Startup Weekends happen in 160 countries around the world, a thousand events a year. We have accelerator programs in, in 26 cities uh, around the world uh, and staff now in, in 45 countries around the world. So we've got a, a, pretty, a pretty big group. Um, and every single company that I've met doing that, and I've invested in, in 40, I don't know, 48 or 49 companies now, um, soon to be 59, hopefully. Uh, but what everyone wants is this, right? Some number going up and to the right over the shortest possible period of time, like users, retention in, in a crazy world, like maybe even revenue. Um, so, you know, everyone wants this kind of hockey stick. The reality when you start a company is much more like this where you get your initial bump of uh, initiation from TechCrunch, where lots of people use the product, then the novelty wears off, the kind of trough of sorrow uh, happens, and then you know, if, if you're unlucky, the kind of crash of ineptitude or, or the company doesn't work out. But it takes a very long time to actually build something that's sustainable, scalable, um, and, and is gonna turn into you know, a big business. And, and in Europe, sometimes it takes a little bit longer than in the US for, for things to really kind of get, uh, get going. But obviously, everyone wants to get to that kind of upside. Um, but it's not all bad. Does anyone know what this is? So this is the first page on the internet. Uh, it's what uh, Tim Berners-Lee put up you know, now, depressingly, actually quite a long time ago. Uh, but if you think of what was created on the internet in the last 30 odd years, um, you know, the amount of amazing companies, the amount of economic value, the number of jobs that have been created, et cetera, it is staggering. We are still only, you know, it's 10 years since this came out, or 11 years. Um, it's certainly not very long since the SDK came out for, for iOS and Android. And again, look at the number of companies that have kind of flourished in the, the mobile world. I think AI, blockchain, you know, IoT, lots of different things, 5G, there's lots of different technologies that are gonna be very exciting over the, the next couple of years. So it is one of the best times ever to start a company. It's also one of the best times ever to raise capital. So this is some research that we did with tech.eu and Stripe uh, last year where we saw a massive increase in the volume of, of early stage funding. So this is um, rounds of less than 3 million euro uh, going into early stage companies, so really kind of seed rounds. Been a 5x increase uh, in the amount of uh, money going into companies over a, a three year period. So uh, great news for people who are starting companies and great news for people who are gonna be pitching at Dragon's Den in a couple of days time. Uh, some stuff that I've learned along the way, please make notes. Uh, I still wake up in the middle of the night, my wife hates it, but uh, like tap things into Evernote or into the Apple Notes. I have, these are actually notebooks that I have as well. Um, so, you know, I'm sure we've all, and I, I'm guilty of this, you have an amazing idea and then, you know, I won't write it down, I'll remember it tomorrow. And then the next day you're like, hang on, what was I thinking about on the bus yesterday? Like, it was a really 
actually important and then you can't remember it. So make notes as, as often as you can. Um, if people, you know, and, and even little things like follow up on emails and stuff like this, uh, it's, it's really important. Um, read, the first question I ask people when I'm interviewing them for, for jobs is kind of what websites they read, uh, what's the last book they read, you know, what, what are the magazines they read, et cetera, et cetera, because I think, you know, A, interested people are interesting people, um, but also it's very important to be aware of what's happening in your industry and in the wider industry. We uh, had conversations around the new Techstars London program over the last three or four weeks, and you'd be amazed at how many people I interviewed when I said, oh, tell me about your competition. They were like, oh, no, we don't have any competition. It's like, oh, well, literally the last three days there have been articles on TechCrunch or Tech.eu or elsewhere uh, about companies in the same space. So be aware of what's happening in your industry. Uh, how many people have had an idea that is so amazing that if you told anyone in this room, they would immediately take off and steal it from you? And, and the idea is so good that you can't tell VCs because they would do the same thing. You want to get everyone to sign an NDA. Be honest, right? I mean, I've done it. Um, the, the reality is, like, ideas, like, ideas are like assholes, right? Everyone has one. Um, execution is the only thing that matters. And, and talking to people, that, like, I've made the mistake lots and lots of times of, of thinking that I had a brilliant idea and not sharing it with anyone. Uh, and then later finding out that there were a bunch of people in my network who could have been super helpful um, and would have been happy to help. And also, Everyone else has their own perfect idea that they haven't just got the time or gotten around to, to doing yet. So uh, don't be afraid to talk to people. There will be opportunities. I'm conscious I'm standing in between you and booze, so, uh, but there will be opportunities to talk to me later on as well. Um, and when you talk to people, here is a crazy idea. But when you're talking to people, listen to what they say uh, in, in response, right? So uh, you'll be amazed at the number of times that I go to you know, start, startup events like conferences or startup weekends or anything else. And people go, hey, I've got a great idea. I'm building the Uber for dog walking, and we're going to make millions of dollars. Do you like the idea? Like, well, first of all, like it's a burst of energy. And right, it's a closed question. All I can say is yes or more likely no, right? Um, so you know, think about asking questions that are actually relevant, like open questions. You know, do you have a dog? How do you currently solve the problem of getting your dog out for a walk every day? Well, by not being a lazy fuck. Um, so you know, ask open questions when you talk to people. I think, particularly when you meet investors. You know, of course, when you're standing on stage, you're going to pitch them. But when you're talking to them in a social environment, you should be kind of eliciting information from them and be more memorable in that way, rather than just kind of bombarding them with. Uh, with stats and info, so um, you know, and, and listen to the replies that people give you. I mean, I can't tell you how meaningful it is to have a conversation with someone and they ask one or two questions. I give a piece of advice or I suggest that they make a connection, and two or three days later they come back and go, "Oh, we did that, and it was great." Like it, it goes a long way, and I, you can bet your bottom dollar that I will talk to those companies many, many more times in the in the future. Um, anyway, building products that that uh, that people love. Um, the reality is that the world is a pretty grim place uh, at the at the moment, um, and we have transposed that into what we do online. So we, you know, a lot of the products that are out there at the moment are, are these three things, right? They're functional, they're reliable, and they're usable. Like, there's no point in launching something if it's not all of those. If you launch something that's not functional, no one is going to, you know, download it. If it's not reliable, you're never going to get any retention. If it's not usable, then kind of what's the point? But we've forgotten about this bit, right? There are not a lot of uh, products out there that give us kind of pleasure in a, in a way that's interesting. Um, and, and, you know, one of the things that we learned at, at Keep is when you create these kind of pleasurable moments or when you create these kind of memorable moments, it, it, it unlocks, you know, the reward pathway in your brain, not necessarily just the sketchy kind of anti-vaxxer posts on you know Facebook where you get likes for being an idiot but uh, like oxytocin and a bunch of other things that are really important in terms of creating memories because there are millions of apps and millions of products out there right that, that are all competing for people's attention so the best way to get retention and get attention is to create these kind of moments of, of magic or create these kind of uh, reward moments for for people so you know and, and our attention spans are declining fairly precipitously um, and, and continuing to, to do so and the reality also is, you know, attention is a unit of, of scarcity nowadays, right? We're not, I mean, if you're working on a startup that's building more time, please, let's talk. Um, but the reality is with, you know, whether it's YouTube or Audible or Kindle or the Daily Mail or whatever it is that people use, you know, th there's no shortage of places for you to go. So, you know, if you're building a company that requires someone to use or download an app or talk to an Alexa or do anything, you're competing against lots of other things, and you've got to think, how do you kind of access their attention uh, in, a, in a meaningful way? Um, and some suggestions to do this, right? Scratch an itch. Um, so I'll give you an example. We see lots of companies pitching us solutions um, 
on an ongoing basis. And one is, you know, I've been a lawyer for 20 years, and every day of those 20 years, I wasted two hours doing process X. And it was really annoying. And then I was at a barbecue with a friend of mine from college, and I talked to them about process X, and they said, why don't you just implement, you know, application Y? And so we decided to start a company, and we built it together, and now we're looking for investment. Um, versus I read an article in Harvard Business Review that said lawyers waste a lot of time on this, so I started a company to, to do it. Right? The person who is scratching an itch that they feel themselves is far more likely to be passionate about the product, engage with the product. In the case of a lawyer that I mentioned, they probably have lots of friends who are in that industry, et cetera. So when you're starting companies, like think about itches that you have in your personal life that you're scratching or itches that you have observed in other people's lives. And that doesn't mean everyone has to be a lawyer for 20 years to do a legal tech company, but you do have to identify an itch and, and kind of think about what's the unfair advantage that you have when you go into that market. You know, how are you going to acquire your first couple of customers? How are you going to get your first thousand users if it's, if it's an app? How are you going to get any users? No one downloads apps anymore. You know, so what are the things that you're going to do to, to actually kind of get over the line in terms of you know, gaining a little bit of attention, gaining a little bit of traction, gaining a little bit of growth or, or, or a little bit of revenue? Um, and as you're thinking about ideas, you should be on all of these places seeing who else is doing it and who else can you learn from, right? AngelList and, and list your company on there because these are hygiene factors. You know, if I'm doing due diligence on a company, I'll go to AngelList and FSuccess and LinkedIn and see, you know, we see a lot of people applying for programs. And I understand, um, you know, people maybe haven't left their job yet to start the company. Um, but we see lots of people kind of, uh, you know, whose company doesn't exist on, on LinkedIn or any of these places. And it can be a little bit... Um, you know, for, if you're asking someone to give you $100,000 or, or you know, half a million dollars um, appearing to exist is, is an important thing. Um, and you know, all of the kind of you know, usual places, when I ask people what their favorite website is or where they like to go for news, the worst answer is Google. Um, you know, I mean, I think people should be aware of Product Hunt and Hacker News and, and you know, Reddit, The Next Web, TechCrunch, like all of these, tech.eu, you know, all of these places are great to see who else is working in your area or adjacent areas, or what are they doing? What have they screwed up? What have they done uh, well? What can you what can you learn from? Um, find a great co-founder. So uh, you know, when we assess companies, at TechStars, we talk about team, 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 market traction idea, and so having someone that you can go on the journey with is is very important. Um, for a whole bunch of reasons. I think, you know, A, being a, a solo founder is, is difficult. Uh, I've invested in a few and, and some have been successful, but it has been a, a very difficult journey for them. Uh, so having someone that you can kind of talk to uh, is, is probably one of the most important things, but also, you know, having a good balance of, of skills in terms of business and technology or, you know, idea and execution, that, that side of things is, uh, is, is really, really uh, important. Um, and surround yourself with great people, like those of you who are, who are here and engaged with, with Future Worlds are lucky, right? It's getting amazing mentors, getting you know, board members, getting advisors, getting people who can you know, help you out with an introduction or a, a connection, right? I mean, the whole, we talk about Techstars as a mentorship-driven accelerator program. The, the first month of the program is connecting the companies with, with about 120 different mentors who can help with legal, finance, marketing, say, like kind of you, you name it. Um, and if it costs you, you know, if, if you're bringing advisors on board and it costs you a quarter or half a percent of your company in options to, to get them there, guarantee you if they're the right people, it'll pay off in the, in the long run. Um, how many people have downloaded documents off the internet and uh, just pressed copy and paste and then filled in their own details? Okay, I see one person wry smile in the front who won't put their hand up and one person who's honest and then a bunch of liars. Uh, so uh, get a lawyer, uh, in all seriousness. There are, like Seed Legals and, and a couple of others will, will be amazing in the early stages of, of, of your, your process. Um, we, and, and little things like getting uh, co-founder agreements, shareholders agreements, all of this stuff is, is really important because it can come back and, and bite you in the, the rear end in the, uh, in, the, in the future. We got sued by Chuck Norris. We put a Chuck Norris character into Farm Villain. Uh, and uh, it was when we were launching the, the iOS app and we sent it through and the guys from Apple came back, the, the reviewers, they were like, are you sure about this Chuck Norris thing? Just put it, it'll be fine. Uh, and so we launched the app, and about two or three days later, we get a letter from, you know, name, 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 and name, uh, legal firm, uh, you know, representing Mr. Charles Norris, uh, unauthorized usage of his image rights, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so we're like, oh, fuck, we have to pull the app, and we made a donation to charity, and all of these things. We emailed the Apple guys, we were like, did you know 
this was going to happen. They were like, you'd be surprised how frequently this happens. Uh, and he finished the email with the words, don't fuck with Chuck. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's very life sage, life. Everyone remembers two or three things from a, a, a talk, right? Uh, if you remember nothing else, don't mess around with, with Chuck Norris's legal team. Um, but in all seriousness, anyone who is, how many people here have started companies already? How many people are thinking of starting a company? Probably should have opened with that, but. Um, there's a great book uh, called Venture Deals by my colleague Brad Feld, um, which I'm sure there are probably copies of it in the library, but you can access it pretty, pretty easily. Um, there are a lot of legal terms in there that you should learn about, but, but vesting is the most important one. Uh, vesting is the idea that you and your co-founders don't all get your shares all at once. You earn them over a period of, of time, uh, typically kind of uh, years, four years, five years. Um, we have had situations in Techstars companies previously where there has been a co-founder breakup or breakdown of some description, and they have been left with a co-founder owning 30% of the company and not involved anymore. Uh, and it becomes very difficult to take shares back from people once they've uh, earned them or, or vested them. Uh, so just be conscious of, of all of these things. Um, more on product now. Uh, so obviously don't build a chocolate teapot. Um, you know, you need to, before you can build a product that someone will love, you have to build a product that someone actually wants uh, or needs. There was a great uh, article I read years ago that said, if you're building a consumer product, the best way to test it is to do a bunch of, of mock-ups, um, which I'll talk about in just a sec, uh, and go out and stand at a bus stop or stand at the entrance to a you know, shopping mall uh, and, and ask people to take a look at the product, right? Just walk them through the journey, but never put the name of the product into any of the mock-ups and never say what it's called. And if you get one or two people at the end of the day going, what's that, what's that called? Like, when can I download it? Then you have a business, right? So you should be kind of constantly thinking about user testing. The best companies in the world are doing this all the time, right? Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, well, Instagram is Facebook, but they're testing, like Instagram will test stuff in New Zealand and Ireland all the time in, in kind of smaller markets where there's less contagion risk if they, if they mess it up. Um, but every company should be kind of thinking about this iterative process on an ongoing basis. If you were at the very early stages of building something and you don't have design skills, these are some tools that you can use to build very basic mockups, clickable prototypes, clickable PDFs. You know, keeps um, seed round of, of funding, the, the first $250,000 that, that, uh, that we did, it was a clickable PDF that, that Brian showed in the, in the pitch meeting. So you, you can, and, and we, you know, I appreciate when I see you know, founders who maybe don't have a full tech team or they're very early in their, excuse me, in their journey showing me mockups. If you're a solo founder trying to find a CTO, if you have mockups and you can show someone that you've learned a new skill to build you know, a prototype of it, they're gonna take you a lot more, a lot more seriously. Um, and I think the other thing is like, you, know, you obviously have to, you have to ship products. Um, I have companies that I've invested in years ago that, that they're still waiting for it to just be right before they fully launch the product. Um, if you want uh, proof of how this works, so Apple, obviously a company obsessed with design, go and look at the very first version of their website. Um, it's, it's not pretty. Uh, but you know, if you're not embarrassed by the first version of something that you've launched, then you're, you're doing it too late. Every product that I've ever launched, if I look back on the early versions of it, it is a total like, you know, red cheek embarrassment fest. So uh, get stuff out there. Um, when you're building products, learn from the mistakes that other people have made. So user onboarding, uh, confusingly, at the URL useronboard.com, uh, does a bunch of teardowns of consumer and B2B products uh, and the, the onboarding process that people go through. And it's incredibly detailed, like 150 slides going through how you get onboarded onto Kickstarter or into Gmail or into lots and lots of other products. But it is really interesting to see where people have done things really cleverly, where people have made mistakes, where popovers and pop-unders and all of these things can and do and don't work. Um, so definitely kind of spend some time, I mean, these guys could do a book, but uh, spend some time learning from the mistakes of others and then spend some time getting feedback from people that you don't know. Um, you know, similar to people coming up going, hey, I'm doing the Uber for dog walking, what do you think? Um, you know, most people have a tendency to tell their friends and family what they're, what they're doing, right? And, and we're social, animals. So if you go and say to your best mate, hey, I'm building the Uber for dog walking, you have a dog, would you use it? What are they going to say? They're going to go, yeah, that's great. Like, of course I'm going to use it. And then they'll go and talk to your mates and go, oh my God. Like, is anyone doing the Uber for dog walking? Because embarrassingly, I did this talk a while ago and someone was doing it. They came up afterwards. They're like, oh, do you really think it's a terrible idea? And it's like, were, were you listening at all? Uh, so get, get real feedback from real people. And this is fascinating. So user Bob, you get people, that they're, they're videoed using your product, right? Um, or even your prototype, your mock-up or, or anything else. But it's just really interesting because real people 
use products in, in weird ways, right? Like it's, it's totally unexpected. And, and when you launch, and particularly as you get to scale, it is fascinating to see how actual users behave with your product because I guarantee you, it is never the way that you thought they were gonna behave with your product, right? Um, make sure your product is, is fast. Uh, so this is Instagram, uh, which I'm sure you, you recognize. Um, when Instagram came out, there were no shortage of, of photo sharing apps in, in the world. Um, but in most of them, you would take a photograph and then you would go to this screen and you would start adding in like, oh, whatever, whatever, avocado on toast, living my best life, whatever. And then you would tag it and then you would click share and it would start uploading here, right? And that little kind of white bar would go across the screen. It would take a very long amount of time. Uh, in Instagram, while you were typing in uh, you know, your caption and thinking about your hashtag and deciding which platforms to share it on, they'd already started uploading so that when you hit that share button, it was instantaneous. And I remember when Instagram came out first, I was like, it's like fucking magic. Like they've discovered some hack for the internet that no one knew existed. Uh, it just turns out they were just op uploading stuff in the, in the background. So making your products fast matters, right? Because this is some research that Akamai did a couple of years ago that still bears out. I've seen it firsthand with uh, open rates and apps and, and much more. Um, but people are super impatient. So if you're building a product that takes five seconds to load, the likelihood of anyone staying, like maintaining their patience for that five seconds is very, very small. So thinking about ways, and this was always the challenge if you were building a native app versus a hybrid app, right? The hybrid apps always took a little bit longer to load, uh, and so engagement rates were, were lower. So just be kind of uh, conscious of, of that. Um, make your products really simple to use. This is a company I invested in called Drink Easy. Uh, no prizes for guessing what they do, but um, what you did was they sent you recommendations every week of, of spirits and beers and different things that you'd like, uh, and then you just replied, hell yes, if, if you wanted one, and, and then they would, they would ship it to you. Right, so it's not, not very hard to understand what, uh, what to do. Um, building B2B products, like can you remove you know, friction from a process that, 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 that people are, are doing. You know, we, we, have a, um, we have a company working on, a company called Flawless that went through the most recent uh, Techstars program that's just working on a very simple process around QA uh, of apps, which companies spend, you know, hours and hours and hours going forward and back on email. They've just built a tool where you can go forward and back within uh, the app development environment uh, and Slack, right? So removing friction, friction from that process, it's saving a lot of time and saving a lot of money for people. Um, Think about what it is that you want users to do. So I don't know if anyone here, this is always an interesting barometer. Does anyone here use Snapchat? Okay, so the shorting the stock was probably the right thing to do. Uh, so in Snapchat, uh, you, what's the first thing you see? Well, for the people who use it, for everyone in the room who doesn't use Snapchat, the first thing that you see when you open it is the camera, right? Because what they want you to do is use the camera. They don't want you to browse through a news feed. They don't want you to you know, like your friend's posts. They don't want you to do They want you to take photographs and send photographs. That is the raison d'etre of the company. And that is the first thing that you see. And again, I see lots and lots of companies going, oh, we're trying to you know, allow people to buy wine using their mobile phone. It's like, okay, great. How many steps does it take me to actually buy the wine? It's like, oh, 17. I mean, I could just walk to the shop faster, right? So think about what it is that you want your users to do and then think about the fastest way to, to get them there. You know, make your story simple when you're onboarding users or you know, even when you're talking to investors. Like, don't make it, particularly if you're building something that's technical, in a room with a VC, you will, I mean, nine times out of 10 in a room with a VC, you're probably gonna be the smartest person in that room anyway. Um, but when you're building something that's technical, you know, you're definitely gonna be the smartest person in the room. And so if you're coming and talking about kind of, you know, words that I would need to go back to college to learn, then, you know, I'm gonna feel like an idiot, right? Which is fine, that happens a lot. Uh, but it's, it's also sometimes a little bit kind of annoying when it does. And, and it is also uh, challenging for your users if you're using acronyms or anything like this. You know, and we've, we've seen it time and time again with people who are building plugins for Skype or different things where they talk about something in a way that they understand perfectly in their business. The users have never heard the phrases before. Um, you know, how do you make your product simple to use, right? So I don't know if anyone uses Pocket, but Pocket is a really easy way to just save pages off the internet. And rather than having to do anything complicated, it's just a plugin in the Chrome browser. It's a plugin in, in iOS. So just, I like this page, click save. Okay, I can add a tag, brilliant. Right, done, one step. It's, and then it's just sat in my uh, Pocket app for me to, to download and use on, a, on an ongoing basis. Because if you make things difficult, this is, this like meet your users, right? This is how people will engage with your product if you don't tell them what to do. And again, like it is, it is and every time I see this, I, I, I think it's funny, um, but it's also something that, that literally happens all the time. Um, the other thing that you've got to think about with, with building any product is like, how do you get people to come back, right? Like it's great, you've built it amazing, you know, but does, what's, what happens next? 
you know, what's the second time? What's your day three, day seven, day 10? Open rate's gonna be like, if it's a B2B product, do people use it on the second day? Do people actually input any information, right? Uh, and this is really important because, you know, retention is, is, is key. And, and there's little things that you can do, like Slack do an amazing job of delighting people, right? Like little features that they add in, send me, I mean, how many fucking passwords does everyone have? Can you remember them all? Like I have a, an entire product that I pay for to remember passwords for me. This is incredible. Send me a mobile sign-in link. Hallelujah, right? Um, you know, little, like Slack particularly, we have people in 45 countries, right? And you message someone, you're like, I can't believe they didn't reply to me. It's like, oh, actually, they're 12 hours ahead of where you are. And you're being a twit thinking that they're going to reply at 3 a.m. Um, you know, and, and, and things like, you know, you're not getting, you're getting notifications from a channel that you're not using. Like, you know, as this person says on Twitter, when's the last time your, your app tried not to be annoying? Like this was, I remember getting this was like incredible. Um, engagement can be simple. So has anyone used MailChimp? Or MailChimp, if you're a serial fan. Um, so uh, MailChimp, when you send, so first of all, before you send the email, the, the monkey sweats, right? Because sending out a bulk email is a, you know, it's a rough thing to do. What if you get it wrong? Or, you know, you accidentally CC everyone instead of BCC everyone. Um, but when you send it, you get this, you know, the hand gives you a high five. The more you click it, the redder the hand gets, right? So like really, really silly and simple things like this. Make people smile when you get to the end of your inbox in, in Google inbox, it tells you have a nice day, right? Like this, this didn't cost them anything to do, but it, you know, the number of people who talk about it and, and tweet about it and, and, and uh, you know, are happy about it is, is amazing. A lot of, a lot of mail apps will, will do that now. You know, cultural references uh, work. This is, was my favorite one on, uh, on GitHub for, for a very long time. Um, you know, injecting a little bit of personality into what you do is, is really important because most, you know, apps are big and blue and boring and, and, and dull, right? And don't have any, any personality. Um, Medium always used to do amazing and still now do release notes, right? And, and again, it's just kind of showing that you have something, showing that you care about your users and showing that you're an actual, you know, human being. You know, Jawbone will send out notes thanking people, uh, you know, for, for sending in issues and, and, and engaging with their customer service team. Um, we invested in a company called Sorry as a Service a, a couple of years ago. Not only do tech stars do things that are very obvious, like investing in companies where it's obvious what the company does from the name, but they send out sorries on behalf of companies who screw up. <clears throat> and so if you have a failed transfer with TransferWise, which is if you see something you don't want to have happen, um, they'll send out a personalized apology in cakes or flowers or various different things on, on your behalf. But again, it's treating people like human beings, right? Your users are not just some number, right? They should be actual uh, people to you. And this is why, right, retention matters. You know, the probability of selling to someone that you've already got in, as, as a user is, is much higher, um, you know, than it is for, for someone new and, and, you know, increases your profitability fairly substantially as well, which obviously increases your chances of, of getting more uh, revenue uh, the other, or more investment or whatever it is that you want. Um, the other thing I would say is don't be afraid to change, right? So this is an app called Bourbon, which was like Foursquare or Goala back in I don't know, 2000. 11, 12, uh, you could check in in places and do various different things. And, you know, approximately no one was using it. But the founders uh, saw that people were using it for one thing specifically. So they would take a photograph and they would apply a filter to it. And then they would take a photograph of their screen and then share that photograph with the filter applied somewhere else. And they were like, oh, it's kind of interesting. Like, uh, I wonder why that's happening. And then they decided, okay, well, actually, no, basically no one is checking in on this product, but they are doing this interesting thing. Maybe we should ditch the check-in app uh, and launch a product where people can apply filters to their photographs and then share them uh, on Twitter or Facebook or whatever else. Uh, and they launched the product called Instagram, which 13 months later sold for $1.3 billion. Uh, so don't be afraid to pivot. Um, for people who were, who were pitching at uh, Dragon Center in general, uh, a few other things. So, I'm a massive Star Wars fan in case previous slides didn't give it away. Um, but when the first teaser trailer came out for the Force Awakens movie, it was, you know, there has been an awakening kind of thing. Um, I was like, just take my money, right? Fuck it. I don't care how much it costs. I'm like those movie and the, the Avengers movies, a bunch of other ones have done them really well. Those teaser trailers where you're like, I, I, I now need to know more about this company or I, about this movie. When you're pitching an investor, it should be the same, right? I don't want chapter and verse in the, the first meeting. I want to be interested enough to go, okay, 
now I want to spend 15 minutes or 20 minutes or you know, half an hour to, to, to learn more about this company. You know, my old sales director in one of my companies used to say, the goal of every meeting is to get another meeting. Right? And so if we meet and you pitch me your company, the goal then is to get another meeting where we talk a little bit more about it, another meeting you know, where we dig in deeper, another meeting with someone that I trust, a meeting where you meet all of our investment partners. And then the next meeting is when you're part of Techstars or we've made an investment. Then the next meeting is hopefully a board meeting. So you know, think about ways to kind of engage people. And, and, and sometimes less is more. Like you know, there was a um, Dave McClure who who's started 500 startups. There was a brilliant video from a couple of years ago where he was like, you know, why can't pitch competitions just be two slides? It's like we allow people to send money from one place to another. We have 200 million dollars in revenue. You want to know more? Come and talk to me afterwards. It's like, all right, you know, you don't always have to have 200 million dollars in revenue, but you know, what is it that's going to get someone excited enough to go? I want to know more about this company. Like, what's your secret sauce? What's the unfair advantage? Going back to what I said earlier. Uh, some final tips. Be personal with people, right? This, this is the worst sentence in the English language. Uh, hi, I'd like to add you to my professional network on LinkedIn. Um, you know, if, if you can't be arsed to say, hey, Eamon, we met at the event in at, uh, Future Worlds, uh, you know, like, you don't even have to tell me you liked your, my talk, but I mean, flattery works. Uh, like, be personal when you're connecting with people. If you're pitching people for investment, any of these things, right? It's just incredibly important to, to, be, to be engaging. Don't be a mass mailer. Hello, merge, under, you know, colon, contacts, underscore, first, underscore, name. I'm really to, keen to discuss how we can support your agency's future growth, right? I have been called a lot of things in my life. Merge, colon, contacts, underscore, first, underscore, name. Not that. And I'm not in an agency, right? So don't be a mass mailer. Likewise, you know, this guy emailed a while ago, we're making the easiest 3D design platform so even children can make 3D models for blah, 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 blah. Our pitch that can be found here. I was wondering if you could advise in the early stage VCs who'd be interested in EdTech. Now, I'd never met this person before. I was like, well, surely if you're looking for VC funding, it's kind of your job to, to figure out who you want to actually invest in the company. So, you know, don't be, and this obviously went out to everyone whose, you know, email address was stolen from LinkedIn or whatever. Um, so just be a little bit personal, you know. This was, uh, Brian, the, the CEO of Keep, sent this email to the CEO of American Express, right? Taking the flyer, don't know if this will ever reach you, you're going to try anyway. You're inspiring, leading the charge and building at the world's freshest financial everything company. In 2011, American Express was a lot of things. It was not the world's freshest financial everything company, but flattery works, right? Awesome and daunting at the same time, you brought a lure to people, blah, blah, blah. I'd love to trade some thoughts with you over lunch and dinner when I'm in New York later this week. Uh, Bill, give you my perspective on how a rewards level will rule the world. Uh, Amex ended up investing about four months after this. He got the meeting in New York that week, uh, and Amex invested in the company. Likewise, he did something similar um, to the guy who started Publicis. We were on the Eurostar going to, to Paris a couple of years ago, and he sent an email going, hey, you know, love this article that you'd written in the FT. Like, you know, can we meet later today? And I was like, yeah, okay. So being personal, flattering, all of this kind of stuff, it, it really works. Be nice to journalists. This article was probably worth about 40000 dollars a month in revenue to, to this company uh, in terms of the volume of attention it, it brought them. Uh, Mike Butcher uh, wrote a great article on how to contact journalists and, and the people from Blonde 2.0, which is a, a PR firm in Israel, uh, wrote a series of articles with European tech journalists about how to pitch them um, and what you know, tools to use, et cetera, et cetera. And we can chat a bit more about that in, in Q&A. Um, as you're building your company, find partners. When we launched Keep into uh, Japan, we, like, no, A, no one knew what Keep was, B, the games that the, the product was actually active in were ones that were popular in the US and Europe, but maybe not so much in, in, in Japan. Uh, and so we had some challenges, you know, figuring out how we would actually get enough, enough users. Um, we ended up partnering with, with, has anyone been to Japan? So Lawson's is a big chain of convenience stores, there's like thousands, hundreds of thousands of them across the country. And they, um, we were partnering with them. They were the rewards partner. They were giving us this fried chicken. Japanese fried chicken in convenience stores is incredible. Uh, and so we were talking to them. We were like, oh, you know, we need to get a little bit more exposure. And they were like, oh, they sent us this out of nowhere. And I was like, okay, it looks amazing. What, what does it say? And they were like, oh, it tells people to download these games. We give them a URL, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we're going to put one of these in the window of every Lawson's in Japan for a month. I was like, Okay, that's that's amazing, um, you know. And those games ended up getting, you know, it was tens and in some cases hundreds of thousands and millions of, of users. As a result, we ended up generating, you know, hundreds of millions of impressions, and, and the launch was extremely successful. Likewise, Paranoid Fan is a company I invested in a couple of years ago who do partnerships with all the NFL teams, Manchester City, a bunch of others. Um, 
And before every game, their app is featured on the Jumbotrons, they're in match day programs, all of this type of stuff. So partners as a distribution channel are, are incredible nowadays because it's harder than ever to get exposure and, and awareness. And that matters because you have to stand out, right? In a world where there are millions of apps on the app store, where there are millions of products uh, out there that people can use, there are endless Kickstarters and Indiegogos and, and everything else, you know, standing out uh, really, really matters. Uh, I'll skip this, uh, but do be excellent to each other, as, as Bill and Ted once said. Uh, and that is it for me. Again, this is me on Twitter. Uh, this is me on email. Uh, you can go to futureworlds.com forward slash ask if you've got any questions. But thank you for your attention and sorry to be wandering in and out of your field of vision. Uh, <laughs> we could do a whole talk probably on, on, on that one. Um, I. I wish I'd invested in Impossible Foods. Um, I didn't, I didn't, not that I had the opportunity, well, not yet anyway, the opportunity to. Um, but I think what they're doing is uh, amazing. It not only, you know, from a uh, like on a planetary scale, but uh, also I think the, the product that they've produced is, is extremely tasty. So uh, I've, I've done quite a bit of investing in food tech recently. They're one that I would have loved to have had the opportunity to, to participate in. Um, City Mapper is another one here, you know, closer to home. I think, you know, incredible company doing doing really well um, and doing some some very very smart stuff. Uh, but yeah, there's there's a list we could we could talk for years. <laughs> very right. So so I launched uh, the the third company that I launched, which didn't work, was a mobile education platform. Right. So we launched it in two thousand. 11, and it was kind of a collaborative, competitive, um, and kind of gamified environment for people who were taking uh, SAT tests. So you could go in and do um, quizzes, you could earn points, you could help your friends, you could do all of these things. Um, but we launched the, it was actually 2009 that we launched it, sorry. Um, we launched it at a point where basically no one had a, an iPhone or a, 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 an Android phone. Like the, the absolute user numbers were, were very low. The product itself, you know, we had. Coca-Cola and Nike and a bunch of people on as partners. We were working with Harvard's Ed Labs um, and, and a bunch of their people on the kind of um, uh, academic side of things. We had partners with some of the best SAT test prep providers in the world. We had partnerships with GMAT test providers. All like everything that you would want to see in a company was was there. Technology was pretty good. Um, just the market was there, but in about four years. Um, so so market timing matters. You know, it's it's a challenge for. For example, we've got a lot of VR companies in our portfolio at the moment, and, and VR is tough, right? Because we don't know, is Oculus going to have its kind of Alexa Christmas, right? You know, everyone, whatever, last Christmas, Christmas before last, it felt like everyone in England and Ireland got an Alexa or got one for their parents or something like this for Christmas. Like, I think everyone is waiting for VR to have that moment, and we've invested in a few companies where you're kind of going, okay, I need you to stay alive for three years. And, and maybe there will be some breakout hits. You know, I mean, I know Facebook are doing some stuff with, with about 50 companies now to kind of help them launch when the, the new Oculus store launches. But um, yeah, market market timing matters. And, and sometimes you have to be, you know, we, we talk about this internally sometimes, but sometimes companies have to be cockroaches to survive, right? You just have to be willing to, you know, batten down the hatches and do consulting work or, you know, do something to kind of pay the bills and, and maybe then the market is ready for you, but it's tough. Yeah, I think I think you you know, as, as cliched as it sounds, like when you know, you know. Um, I mean, with the the mobile education business that we did, like I ran it into a brick wall, I don't know, a dozen times probably, um, and eventually sat down with a couple of friends when I was like, like what what am I doing? That's wrong here, right? I'd, I'd had two successful companies before. I kind of knew a little bit of of, of what I was doing. Uh, and they were like, well, no, you know, does anyone actually is, is anyone using it? I was like, well, no. And they were like, well, you know there's what's going wrong like it's not that you've built a shit product or it's not that you've a terrible team or it's not anything else it's just that like there, there's no one there um and then it becomes a question of like well do I, am i willing to wait what, what could have been four or five years for for someone to get there um and and then you start to kind of internalize and ask questions of your you know are you willing to do that and, and you know how do you actually keep the lights on how do you pay rent, how do you eat, you know, all of these things are incredibly important. Um, so I think it's, it's by talking to people, it's by having conversations with folks who've been there, with mentors, with advisors, and taking their advice and guidance on board. But the other thing I would say is you will, and, and I've seen it 
dozens of times with companies that I've invested in where it hasn't worked out, with companies that I know where it hasn't worked out. You as an entrepreneur will know when the time is right. You might not be willing to admit that you know, and it might take you six months to admit it to yourself that you know, but you will know when the time is right. And then it becomes a challenge of, in this part of the world, we still view failure as something that's incredibly negative. Like in the US, they're like, oh my God, you failed, like fucking amazing, like go and do your next thing. Here, it's like, oh, I better you know, not talk to anyone for the next two years in case anyone finds out it didn't work out. And I think we're getting better, right? That's immeasurably better than when I, when I started my company, it was like, you didn't talk to anyone for the rest of your life, like you became a hermit. Uh, but I think you know, we as a society need to be a lot more accepting and, and uh, understanding of, of failure, because it's frequently not that you know, the company is bad, the person is bad, any of those things. It's just, sometimes that's just the market. There's a bunch of different ways. I mean, the, the people I started companies with were in, in two cases, someone that I went to secondary school with, and in one case, someone that I went to college with. Um, so you meet really good people and really good friends in, in, you know, in those experiences. Like if you, you know, go through six years of Catholic secondary school in, in Ireland you know, as, as someone who hated everything to do with all of that nonsense, um, and you very quickly come to realize who your actual friends are and who you can get on with. Likewise, in college, you, know, you form friendships pretty quickly. So finding people that you really get on with is, is, is obviously one way. I think the other way is you know, we see a lot of companies, probably 20 or 30% of companies that come through a startup weekend end up staying in existence, right? So if you're going to something, you know, whether it's, it's future worlds, whether it's a startup weekend, whether it's meetups, whether it's talks like this, you're self-identifying as being interested in something to do with the entrepreneurial journey. And so it's meeting people, it's having those conversations, it's talking to people, right? Like I talk to a lot of people who are looking for co-founders and I go, well, have you asked anyone, have you told anyone what you're working on? Have you asked them to be a co-founder? You know, crazy, crazy idea. If you if you tell people what you're doing, and if they get enthused and engaged, which is why the startup weekend events are so good, that's a great way to find people. And then it's just a matter of spending time with that person to make sure that you trust one another, um, that you connect, with, well, that you can work with one another, right? Because some people like working early in the day, some people like working late in the day, and we've had clashes of personalities in in TechStars programs previously, where people who'd never really met in the real world before came together and met for the first time for a 13-week program where they were living cheek by jowl. You know, that doesn't always work, so you've got to build a little bit of a, um, a relationship with people, I would say. But it's, it's tough, right? Like, you know, starting a company, I mean, you know, I view every, every investment that we make, because we're investing pretty early, you know, you're talking about it being probably a 10-year, maybe 12-year life cycle, maybe even more in, in, in some cases with companies. And so, in a lot of cases, I'm going to be on the board, I mean, I'm already on the boards of companies for six years, you know, and, and um, you're going to be working with your co-founder for a long time, even the co-founders of businesses that I started in the past. You know, in one or two cases, we're, we still talk a lot, but it, it can be a tough process to go through. Um, so I think you've got to kind of do your due diligence on one another and really build a relationship over time. Yeah, we see, I mean, there's been a couple of things. I think probably when we came to Europe first, uh, even six years ago in general, the companies that were coming into the program were much earlier, so like it was still idea or concept stage or really early prototype or, or MVP. So Lingvist, who are the language learning guys whose board I sit on, um, when they came into the program, uh, they had the, probably the ugliest prototype of any product, maybe still, that I've ever seen. Um, but they had an amazing team, they had a, an amazing piece of technology, um, now, I think if they had applied for this year's program, it might have actually been much more difficult for them to get in. So the companies applying now, you know, most people have raised, you know, at least an SEIS round if they're in the UK. In, in most cases now, companies coming in have raised probably half a million to two million pounds coming in, you know, and now they need help to figure out like, what to do with it um, and, and how to scale. Now companies coming in are already at, you know, 20,000, 50,000, 100,000 users or, you know, I mean, if I think of the companies that we had in the program last year, you know, the range was probably between five and 150,000 in MRR for the B2B companies, and certainly into the high tens of thousands for the B2C companies, because it is easier to start a company now. You know, like when I started my first company, there was no AWS, you know, there was no WordPress, there was nothing that we could, you know, there was no, I mean, in Dublin, there were no accelerators, there were no men, there were a lot of people who take 10% of your company for making an introduction and, and, and not, very, not very much more than that, but, um, 
like all of that has evolved, you know, and I think the biggest thing also is the kind of evolution of people coming out of, you know, markets that we hadn't seen before. So, you know, last year's program, we had companies from Korea, Ukraine, Hong Kong, uh, India, you know, all, all of these different places. And, and I spent a lot of time traveling around Asia and, and, and Eastern Europe and a little bit in Africa. And, you know, now everyone has access to the same Coursera courses or the same iTunes University courses, the same Medium articles, the same, you know, Harry's 20 minute VC podcast, you know, like the, the playing field is a lot more level now than it has ever been. And so the global competition is, is growing as well. But certainly the companies are a little bit later stage now. I think it's build, build you know, whether, whether it's with us or with any investors, build a relationship, you know. I mean, most companies apply for Techstars at least twice before they get in, in many cases. I mean, the, the paranoid fan guys that I talked about earlier, they'd applied, it was the eighth time that they applied that they got into the program. Um, and they're now arguably one of the most successful companies that I've ever invested in. But the previous times that they'd applied, they just weren't ready, right? The, the fit wasn't quite there, the momentum wasn't quite there, the traction wasn't quite there. Um, but they were really good at building a relationship with people in Techstars throughout that entire process. So they would continually kind of send us update emails saying, hey, you know, once a month. And I tell every, I mean, if you take one thing away from tonight, it's create a monthly update email that you just send, whether it's to the people that you meet on Future Worlds, whether it's to friends, family, investors, mentors, anyone, because it kind of holds you to a cadence of, of communication. It helps people kind of see what's going on and track momentum. And, and in my case, in a lot of occasions, you know, you meet a company on, on kind of day one or day, day minus 10 in some cases, um, and over a two or three or six month process, you know, you get enough data points to go, okay, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna make an investment now. Um, and I mean, we have, we have companies that will be joining us on this year's Techstars program that I first started talking to 18 months ago. Right? And, and they have just kind of kept me informed, kept me updated, but the stars haven't quite aligned for them and me, and that's, you know, that, that's not on them, that's in, in some cases on me. Um, but after building that relationship for a long time, now I know, okay, I'm, you know, I, can, I can make this investment, I can, I can make this, this work. So I think, don't be afraid to, you know, we all, I think pretty much everyone at Techstars is on Twitter, everyone has, you know, if you see my email address is amon.carey at techstars.com, you can probably take a wild guess at what everyone else's address is at, uh, at the company. Um, so I would say just kind of get in touch with people, but be personal. Like if you're gonna talk to KV, who runs our, our FinTech program in London, you know, email them and say, hey, I read about one of your companies after demo day last week and I was really impressed with what they'd achieved in three months. I would love to have 10 minutes of your time to ask you about this specific thing, right? Chances are he'll get back to you on that rather than if you say, hey, I've got a FinTech company, can we talk? So like be really specific. Don't be afraid to use flattery. You know, don't obviously be over the top. Don't kind of like every tweet that anyone has ever sent and then send them a kind of, you know, glowing email because we, you know, we're not idiots as well. <laughs> Not all, but um, so I think that that's what I would recommend is like don't be afraid to build a relationship, right? Because because fundamentally that's what all of this is. If if you know if we invest in your company, like I say, it's going to be you know I would hope a ten year journey to standing on stage at the you know New York Stock Exchange ringing ringing a bell together, um, and and that's the way that I would view it. Like you know it's it's like any relationship, right? You have to build it over time and, and work on it and and, and nurture it. Um, so yeah, don't be afraid to talk. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you. Thanks a million.